If you have your Bibles, uh, we're wrapping up a series, uh, Matthew 6, and we're talking about pray like this. Uh, uh, the Lord taught us how to pray. The disciples asked him how to pray, and he said, pray like this, and he taught he gave us a guide in how to pray. And we've talked about that prayer. We talked about the beginning. And, and we talked about the declarations, three declarations of who God is. And then we talked about, uh, we we're talking about the third declaration of our personal needs. And we're going to be looking at that today. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 13 and then we're going to unpack this today. Matthew 6, 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Your uh, copy of the scriptures may say from the evil one. Uh, it's, uh, it's both uh, is okay. We'll talk about that. But lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The question uh, that comes up is, uh, can God lead us into temptation? And we uh, think about that uh, a little bit. Hopefully, I can answer that question today. Uh, I was asked uh, by somebody, I don't remember who they were, but uh, I came to Christ as a boy, okay, eight years old. I came to Christ, and, and uh, somebody asked me the question. They said, uh, you're, you're kind of, uh, you're a pastor, you're an example to other people, and blah, blah, blah. And, and they said, do you ever uh, sit through a sermon, and your mind drifts, and you want to go to sleep? And I thought, well, not when I'm preaching, <laughs> but, but uh, I thought, oh, yeah, I do. And, and what they were really saying is, uh, okay, you teach us, you teach the scriptures to us, but do you still battle with sin? Heck yeah, I do. Every day uh, I battle the flesh, I battle temptation that comes in fact, I'll let you in on a secret. I have sinned more grievously since I've been a believer than before I was a believer, okay? And if you're here today and say, oh, Mark, I never deal with temptation. I never deal with the struggle to, uh, for my flesh. Please come deliver the sermon for me. <laughs> uh, I need to hear it. I may go to sleep, but I, I need to hear I need to hear that uh, sermon. But let me let me uh, say this: Can God lead us into temptation? It says in John uh, James one thirteen. It says this: Let no one say when he is tempted, "I'm being tempted by God," for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So the scriptures answer the scriptures. God cannot and will not lead you into temptation. So what is uh, Jesus teaching us here in this prayer when he says, do not lead us into temptation? I wanted to define two words for you, and both of them uh, deal with this word temptation. The word temptation here literally means uh, trials and testings, but let me define for you a minute. A temptation, and let me read this, uh, an enticement to do self-service or evil instead of God-centered service. Satan uses your flesh to entice you to make you gratify stealth instead of God. God will not tempt you to sin or do self-centered evil. So the enemy comes and he entices you. And how many times have we seen the that enticement like a lure for a bass, and he it takes it. 
that that's what temptation is. But what is testings and trials uh, that come our way? Testing and trials shows the strength, integrity, or growth in an object. Testing and trials are allowed by God for special purposes. Okay? So, you go through trials. You, you may say, God, why am I going through this? But he has allowed it to uh, stretch you and to grow you into Christ-likeness. James 1, 2 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. So te- testings come to uh, mature you into Christ's likeness. So how does God use testings in our life? And I'm going to go back to the passage because I want you to see the text and what I believe Jesus is getting across. But how does God use testings and trials in our life? Two ways. Number one, to develop a faith muscle. Uh, Just like you physically work out to uh, develop uh, physical muscles, trials and testings come your way to uh, show you where you're at so that you may need to work on uh, something. Uh, testings and trials come. We, um, we're celebrating a Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day is for those who have given their life in service in defending our country. And, and it's a great holiday. It's so much more than hot dogs and hamburgers. It is remembering those that have uh, given their life. But each of those um, each of those young men or young women started out in basic training. The deal about basic training, they developed them physically, mentally, emotionally, made them tough, and they gave them skills so that they were ready when they got into wherever they were deployed to. And so, spiritually, testings and trials come to you, are allowed by God, so that you can develop that faith muscle so that you will be ready for whatever you face out there, okay? So, sometimes we think, oh God, you're being so hard on me. Understand, he loves you so much. He's preparing you for what is out there. So number one, you're developing a faith muscle. Number two, it's to mature you uh, spiritually. It's to mature you spiritually. We call this sanctification. Sanctification is a process towards Christ-likeness, okay? It says in Philippians 1.6, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So he is working in you whenever you came to Christ, however old that may be. For me, it was eight. For you, maybe 18, uh, young adult, older adult, whatever. What God did in that time is he placed his spirit inside of you as you committed your life to him and he is growing you up into Christ's likeness and until the day we're fully in his presence we will uh, face trials and testings that come our way but what about the sins we commit on a daily basis what are the consequences of sin for believers, okay? We, uh, I, I've just said, I, I've been honest enough to say, my sinning has been post-Christian it, more than pre-Christian. What does uh, sin do to me uh, as a believer? 
number one, uh, it breaks my fellowship with the Father. Okay, it breaks my fellowship. My relationship is established. It was established when I embraced Jesus and what he did on the cross. He forgave me. I became a son, and many of you, daughter, son or daughter of the king at that point. My relationship was established. However, when I sin, it distorts my fellowship with the Father. Uh, I choose self over choosing him, and thus I have the consequences of that choice. Um, case in point, if I fleshly murder somebody and, uh, or I uh, condemn somebody, you know, wrong, slander, or whatever, I... I can go to the Father and say, Father, forgive me. I can even go to that person and say, not if I murdered, but I can go uh, to their family and say, uh, forgive me, but I'm still going to be put in jail, okay? So uh, if my fellowship is distorted. My sin also affects other people and, along with my fellowship of him. Um, you remember Achan in the Old Testament. If you don't, I'm going to tell you about Achan right quick. Joshua is leading the children of Israel. They come to Jericho. They go around. They were commanded at Jericho to wipe out everything, okay? Wipe out everything. All man, woman, uh, animals, uh, burn it all. T take nothing. So they do Jericho. Then they uh, go uh, against a little town called Ai. Uh, and they get their tails kicked. And they come and they say, oh God, what happened? And he said, there's sin in the camp. And so they uh, take all the tribes. They narrow it down to a tribe. Then they uh, narrow it down to a family unit. And then they, it falls to a guy named Achan. He took something that was supposed to be destroyed. And so his sin affected the whole group. So if you think your sin only affects you and doesn't affect everybody else, you are mistaken. It affects the whole body of Christ. And, uh, and it's uh, uh, a struggle there. So, broken fellowship with the Father. Number two, the consequence of sin in my life is spiritual dryness. Uh, spiritual dryness. Prayers seem to bounce off the ceiling. They don't uh, seem to go to the Father. There's just a dryness there. The Scriptures are a chore instead of a blessing. And they're a chore so much, I may put it on the shelf. Uh, I avoid spiritual things and spiritual groups. I don't want to be in community. I don't want you to remind me of, of the sin in my life. So we avoid spiritual people or spiritual things. Uh, and and you, uh, I guarantee you, there were people that were sitting right where you're sitting, and now they aren't here anymore. And we think, why did they get mad at the church, blah, blah, blah. And I want you to know, I believe it was a sin and a spiritual dryness that came into their life. Uh, I'm not defending uh, everything we've ever done, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, when we walk around uh, our neighborhood, I've got the philosophy from walking our, our neighborhood for a couple of years. If a yard is unkept, weeds, uh, it grows, uh, uh, it's grown exponentially or whatever. I, I have come to figure there's something wrong in that house. And, and uh, uh, whether they're old or ill or whatever, uh, or they've got financial problems. I've just discovered 
the yard is a sign of something going on in the house. If somebody is not worshiping involved in spiritual things and they consider themselves a believer and they're not here, then I've got to think there's something wrong in them. And you say, oh, Mark, you're being judgmental. No, I'm just fruit inspecting. I, I look at them not being here. I, I get concerned in that area. So it's spiritual dryness. Number three is mental anguish. Mental anguish. When we sin and um, it, it becomes hard to concentrate on spiritual things, um, we, we seek to gratify the self. You remember David, King David in the scriptures? King David, uh, he lived in the city of David. He lived up... Uh, you can see down the whole city. And he looked upon a, a, a woman bathing Bathsheba. He committed adultery uh, with Bathsheba. Uh, he, he had her husband Uriah eventually killed. And uh, David thought he got away with it. But I want you to know there was anguish that was going on inside of David. Nathan the prophet finally came and confronted David on this. You want to know about mental anguish? Go read Psalm 51. Read Psalm 51. Uh, and you see the anguish. He's broken. He's contrite. He's, uh, the conviction is so overwhelming. So mental anguish comes in. So here's my thought. Satan can manipulate trials into temptations. How you respond to trials is the key. So this scripture is saying, Father, do not lead me into trials that are going to lead me into irresistible sin, but deliver me from the evil one. Who is the evil one? Uh, what, why does the devil tempt us? Why, uh, when you came to Christ, why does he just back off and say, I lost another one? Well, uh, he doesn't work that way. Two of his names, a devil, which uh, we see in the scriptures, means adversary or one who comes against you in a conflict. Um, when you came to Christ, uh, it was an exciting time. Uh, Al did the baptism class today, and we get excited about that. We get excited about people coming to Christ. But probably nobody told you when you came to Christ, welcome to the battle. Because you see what happened, you got a tattoo of a target. Bummer reverse mark, Hal, if you remember that. And, and uh, it's there, and you got that, and you uh, welcome to the battle. And uh, that's what devil adversary means. Uh, Satan, the other word, means slanderer or accuser, one who calls your shortcomings. And a lot of times he's right on. Uh, Look at you. You call yourself a believer and you think that or you do that. And it's like a courtroom scene and uh, somebody, an attorney, is just laying things out for you and, and accusing you and maybe right at, at certain points. But Satan, he is about marring the image of Christ any way he can. He is not equal with God. It's not uh, the force and the dark side, okay? Uh, Satan is under the authority of God. I, I promise you uh, that is the case. He is not equal with God. In fact, he has to submit to the authority of the Father in all things. That's why he entices our flesh and our fleshly desires. If Satan cannot keep you from Christ, he will attempt to mar the image of Christ in you. 
Uh, look at marriage today. Um, marriage is supposed to uh, be a biblical picture of the relationship of Jesus in his church. It's an earthly picture of a man and a woman and the oneness that comes in that. It's a picture of the beauty of Jesus Christ. However, you look at how marriages are under incredible attack today. He's attempting to mar the image of Christ any way he can. So I thought about this. What keeps most people from Jesus today? Is it a blatant evil from the world that's living according to its nature or is it believers who claim Christ but whose lives look just like the world? I believe it's believers that look just like the world. So, rethinking this verse. Father, don't put us into any process or situation that is going to draw us into irresistible sin. In other words, we're saying, Father, we're going to stay in the boat and you navigate the rough waters. Or I look at it this way. When Satan tempts you and he knocks on the door of your heart or whatever the temptation, Jesus, you answer it. You answer it for me. The... Lord's Prayer is a guide, okay? It's not something to be regurgitated, even though it's great to memorize. But it's a guide of how we are to pray, and we put the meat on the bones. We begin by acknowledging who God is and his mighty attributes, and then we move to the acknowledging that God is providing for our everyday needs. We talked about, give us this day our daily bread daily provision. We said, forgive our trespasses, daily pardon. We said, deliver us from evil, daily protection. So these are daily things. All of these he has promised ahead of time before we even ask. So ultimately, when we seek these things, we know he is honored and lifted up. So you got to stay with me here. Because this is something the Lord really showed me this week about this particular passage. The scriptures, we insert ourselves way too much. This is telling us about God. This prayer is even about God. It's acknowledging he's the king. He's holy. He's set apart. He is going to provide your daily needs that are there. So, the, this scripture can be interpreted this way. Father, please don't, don't lead me into any area where I might mar or defame your holy name and lead people away from you. You see the difference? It's not about us. It's about God. You are holy. You're the king. Please protect me from going out and defaming your name in this world. So what? Three quick points. Number one is this. There's an invisible war taking place, and we ultimately win. I've read the end of the book, We Win. We Win. Jesus paid the ultimate price for mankind, he will return one day and the battles will cease. But until then, we must fight. We must fight. If you don't know this war is taking place, you're seeing, I said invisible war, because we are seeing uh, the results of this war. We're seeing it in our homes. We're seeing it in schools. We're seeing it on college campuses. You're seeing it in your work. You see these things taking place. But Jesus paid the ultimate price. And until we're in his presence, 
we are going to continue to fight. That's number one. Number two, under so what? The best way to approach the battle is to stay close to our commander-in-chief. The best way to approach the battle is to stay close to our commander-in-chief. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Everybody likes to resist the devil, right? Or I resist the devil. And, and listen, you cannot resist the devil until you submit to God. That's the key factor. You submitting to God, and he will, he will fight the battle for you. Submit to God. Submit fully to him. There was a man who had built a plane, okay? And he uh, was flying this plane, and he heard a sound. And he heard a sound of a rodent, a rat, had gotten into his plane and was gnawing his cables. And he heard that, and he thought, oh, I don't know what to do. I, I'm not sure if he's going to damage and I could crash. I'm not sure what's going to happen. And then he remembered that rats cannot handle the altitude that a human can. So he took off at a higher altitude, and eventually he did not hear the gnawing anymore because the altitude uh, killed the uh, rat. And I thought about that story, and I thought, you know, for us, when the enemy comes gnawing, we need to draw close and altitude to the Father. And the closer we get to him, the more we will see the enemy flee. So, stay close to the commander-in-chief. And then last of all, realize all you do, all you do, reflects who you ultimately put your faith in. And, and we've said this before, that your if you were to, if people were to look at your bank account, your Google searches, or your calendar, could they tell who your God is? Well, yeah, they can. And everything you do reflects in who you put your faith in. Do you put it in the flesh, or do you put it in a, a loving God? Um, and and the way I look at it is, how are you when nobody's looking? Ah, I, I wish I'd have never heard that. You know, we compare ourselves to one another and we're pretty good, but what about, what about when nobody's looking? I wrap up with this. Some of you are dealing with some sin areas in your life. Maybe some of them go back to uh, teen years or college years when you really blew it. Maybe there was an abortion or maybe uh, you, uh, you promised you would never go that far with your girlfriend or boyfriend and, and you had sex outside of marriage and and it, it, the consequences of that have just weighed on you uh, incredibly, or maybe you did something illegal. I don't know what it may be, but you're saying, can God actually set me free from that? I want you to know he can. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. How do you do that? Well, you confess, you agree with God that you've stepped out, of, uh, out of, against his will. You've stepped into the flesh. Uh, you confess. You repent. You change your direction. And you repent. Uh, at times, you may need to go to somebody else and say, hey, please forgive me. I, I messed up here. You want to deal with it. Keep short accounts of wrong in that area. And so, if you're dealing with that today, don't carry that shame and garbage anymore okay um, second of all uh, thought is this and we're about to 
enter our ministry time, so I want you to think about this in your heart. Um, maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ. I mean, you've, you've been baptized, you've attended church, but there's never been a time in your life where you're saying, oh, I sense the conviction of my sin in my life, and, and Jesus, I come today, commit my life to you. And so if that's you, I, I want you to know he's waiting. He's waiting for you right now. Third and lastly, trials and testing. Some of you are under trials right now, and it's just eating you up, and you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I can make it. God thinks a lot more of you than you think of yourself. He is strengthening you in the midst of that. And I don't know what the trial is. Maybe it's physical, maybe it's spiritual, maybe it's emotional. But you need somebody to pray with you. Maybe you need to come uh, kneel at these steps and take it to the Father. One last thing. Did I say that already? I'm I'm sorry. Uh, you know, when I used to go to school and it was test day and the teacher would put the test on my desk, the teacher was silent at that point. You know, she was quiet or he was quiet. And uh, sometimes it seems that way with testing. We cry out, God, where are you? And he seems to be silent. But I, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that his spirit is there and he will not leave me. He will not forsake me. He will bring me through to the other side. I promise you.